Thank you. <clears throat> I'm very happy and honored to have been invited to give this lecture now a little less than six months before Paris. And uh, I thank you all, in particular, Bo Kielen, who has asked and insisted that I could come. And it's a, it's a pleasure just to stop from this uh, very, <clears throat> very demanding process, not always rewarding process, to be here with having a more peaceful and uh, thoughtful, I'm sure, uh, interaction than one I normally do these days. I wanted to share with you some elements of how we see and uh, based on what kind of expectation uh, the Paris Agreement could look and uh, why we are trying to develop a vision of a more global outcome than the, the agreement itself. And that's why I, I wanted to explain you today. Uh, just to come back to the idea that um, this process is, a, as we said this morning, is a complex process because it's trying to solve and to respond to uh, an extraordinarily challenging issue, which is a product of a billion of people activities, uh, the second industrial revolution's outcomes, and, uh, and uh, in a way the core, uh, the core itself of the development pathway for the past century. So <clears throat> it's not simple, and uh, most of the time, of course, people don't understand why we are so long to create a framework to address that, but just I think it's good to remind us that it is very difficult. I have sometimes a comparison in time. When you look at the trade negotiation, it took uh, more, it took since 1948 until 1994, <clears throat> that 50 years, to agree on something which is far more simple than uh, addressing the issue of climate change. Uh, discussing about the trade liberalization, meaning to lower the, um, the barriers to trade, uh, and even not all, but some of them only, and just to, to have a, a, just a reform of the border tax, and uh, is something uh, normally much, more, much easier. But it still took 50 years to have a broader agreement. So when we started this in 1992 only, and of course we are already uh, uh, <clears throat> not totally, of course, going, going at full speed, I must say, but still uh, we have to understand that it is a very complex. And that's why this convention uh, of 1992, this climate regime, has been trying to respond to a, a number of difficulties and failures and has proved an enormous dynamism uh, the, the length of the process, the difficulties, is in a way hiding uh, whatever the, the deep changes and the deep process of essays and errors that has characterized this, this regime. And it is a profoundly evolving regime over time. And we, when we see all the sort of the main milestones since Kyoto in 1997, where Kyoto was all about timetables time and targets, <clears throat> sometimes uh, described as a to totally top-down exercise, which was not re really the case, but nevertheless, it was portrayed like that. Uh, and when you see uh, the, the, tr the different, of course, the difficulties of Kyoto to, to have everybody on board, and uh, the attempt in Copenhagen later, um, and the different aspects that were finally finalized in Cancun, uh, in particular, this notion that the developing countries could put NAM as nationally appropriate measures on the table, transform, and, and in Cancun, again, the prospect of having a legally binding agreement was absolutely uh, out uh, of the table, and then came back, even in Cancun, uh, as an attempt, and finala finally uh, uh, took part in Durban platform, uh, with this idea we need one. We need not only a commitment from countries on a voluntary basis, we need more than that. We need a framework. We need a more centralized framework to, to achieve that. <clears throat> and that's what, in a way, uh, has le led to Paris. So anyway, we are constantly adjusting this process to try to respond to the challenges to encompass the complexity. 
<coughs> and in a way where we are there is to try to go from a deep and narrow agreement, which was supposedly, again, it's a simplification to be the Kyoto style, to a shallow and large one, which is trying to, of course, less, have less of a profound commitments, in particular in the legally binding form of these commitments, but have everybody on board. And so we had finally a very classical evolution of many treaties with the view that because it's climate change and because greenhouse gases are a global problem, a, a common pool resource problem, uh, we have to have, of course, at least a base of a very large agreement, even if we can go on certain aspect and certain sector. Uh, probably a sort of a more narrow and, uh, and more deep one. <clears throat> this uh, figure is uh, what has been in a QN and a David Victor paper, I think in 2009, uh, representing, uh, I think, something which was very useful for me when we decided to, to design the strategy for the Paris Agreement. And in particular, when you look at, the, of course, what is, uh, if we think that finally addressing climate change is a product of many, many action and many, many elements, the notion that uh, we have a regime complex more than an agreement, which is only as a central mechanism that can really modify whole behaviors, <clears throat> I think this notion that in, finally uh, the, the regime is complex and is uh, constituted by different elements, and you have to work on all these elements. Of course, these figures of 2009 is, uh, should be now, now different because we have many more elements in there. Uh, but the interest was just to show that uh, not only UNFCCC, which is in the upper right, but as well IPCC is embedded in the regime. Uh, there are, of course, the action of uh, agencies, but the action of local authorities, multilateral development banks, etc. And that, even there, you can find that it's a club of countries who are doing, and, and now more and more it's a club of companies or a club of cities. So this notion that the regime is complex, <clears throat> again, was very useful for me to design what could be the outcome of Paris. If we don't believe in miracles, which will not happen in climate change, and, and of course I will make this available for everybody. And it's a famous paper of Victor and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Kion, which is quite, at least the figure is very useful. The paper is good, but the figure is particularly useful. <clears throat> and if we don't believe in miracles and one text, one legal text can do everything, which is not the case. There is no the evidence that the legal agreement and internal treaty will modify behaviors of billions of people. So we have to understand the result, the outcome of Paris as something if we want to be serious and really to uh, produce a shift in the expectation in the, for, for the future. So we have to work at these, at these different levels and the concept of Paris outcome is exactly based on that. So the rationale behind the Paris Agreement is uh, clearly building on the theory of rational expectation, which is in this house, would not be surprising. Uh, Sw Swedish economists have, uh, have been really active on this front. And <clears throat> so the idea is to think about that, how we can modify the expectation so to modify behaviors. And these are different behaviors, investors' behaviors, don't obey to the same incentive and, and don't respond the same than, I don't know, uh, developers in, in urban planning or whatever. So the notion that we have to work on this and we have to work on all the elements of the climate regime, having a broad conception of this regime and to try in all of these elements to make the expectation of every of these opinion leaders or actors or principles, if we would use this, um, sort of this concept uh, borrowed from economics, all these principles have to share the same expectation, that the way we think the change can happen, not because a legal treaty will decide it, because everybody would think that this will happen. So it is very much relying on the fact that a self-fulfilling prophecy will make the job. So how you create this, of course, is another story, but that's behind the Paris uh, outcome uh, that has I, try, I propose to the French government, and apparently they just accept that. So what is at stake in 2015? It's simple in a way. It's about changing economic and political signals in favor of the low-carbon economy. 
and it's about the alignment of expectation of government, local authorities, businesses, consumers, and citizens. So uh, on the 12th of December, the formula of the success of Paris could be this one, expectation of change. Most of people, 50, I don't know what the threshold should be, believe that this, this will happen. So of course, this doesn't mean that it is simple to do. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes I use a metaphor uh, it is uh, like a sheep dog. In a way, it's like uh, to, to push people and countries and everybody from, from behind to say that's the direction you have to go to. Or at the same time, like uh, the magic float, that how you attract people to go in that direction. But the notion, but basically because we lost, we don't have, we never had, by the way, the notion of a centralized emission of the signal have disappeared together with the timetable and targets in particular. Uh, including a global carbon price. I put that in black because I feel that in many of my colleagues in universities believe that we should go back to this. This is so much cleaner, simpler, and more, and more nice in a way. If we could have one central signal and everything would align around this signal, that would be so good. It cannot happen uh, once because many countries don't want that and, and many, many, many other reasons I would not delight. But so as we don't have this, we have to produce the signals in different areas and, with, and uh, attracting different actors which don't respond again to the same incentives. So that's why we describe uh, the Paris Alliance for Climate Action around based on this looking for uh, converging expectation and, and making this signal appear in different areas of the complex climate regime that we should have a legally binding agreement, by the way, that the mandate France has received from the Durban platform, so we have to deliver that. That's what we are, in a way, paid for, or we pay for, depending on you, the way you see that. It's quite expensive, by the way. I, I should not recommend any country to do that again. <coughs> we, we, of course, we have, and, and for me, it's separate, because that's the, the group of what the countries are decided to put forward for this first phase, for 2015 which we call the intended nationally determined contributions. We have to have a financial signal, uh, which is both respond to, to um, the commitment of 100 billion per year in 20, by 2020 that was promised in Cancun. <clears throat> but moreover, to look for a post-2020 vision, which is how the financial system respond to the financial necessity of uh, the transition to this low carbon economy. And we added a, another area, which we call now the Lima Paris Action Agenda or Solution Agenda, which is a capacity to capture <coughs> the commitments, meaning the plans and the expectation of uh, a number of non-state actors, non-parties to the agreement, but will make a big difference for the agreement itself. And these four elements, of course, is a simplification from the complex climate regime I presented to you, uh, will be in a way the outcome of Paris. So four elements uh, to simplify again uh, what we are looking for. And uh, there are of course uh, these four elements and the, they have of course a huge linkage. Um, the, depending on the rule we decide on the legally binding agreement, the contribution would be rather different uh, you may know that we have had in Lima a long discussion about the inclusion of adaptation of what we call in our jargon the mean of implementation, meaning finance in particular and technology in the contribution of the countries, whereas some countries were insisting on the mitigation aspect of these INDCs. So there are of course linkages between finance and INDCs, uh, between the rules in the legally binding agreement and this contribution and of course on the capacity of government to be more optimistic about their capacity to deliver. And this is very much related to the Lima Paris Action Agenda itself, meaning the capacity of businesses and uh, local authorities to engage and to demonstrate they believe that this will happen and not, and re relatively with reasonable cost. So if we just think that all this, we have to think broadly, but then we have to find something in common between all these elements. And in a way, like for every type of institutional arrangement, 
and in particular international institutional arrangement, we are in a way looking to these six points, which are classical in environment governance. We should find that in each of these elements you have a consistency, coherence, and that we don't have trade-offs and contradiction between all the elements, or at least uh, diminish these trade-offs. Accountability, uh, if we again work on the global climate regime concept, uh, government are not the only ones who should be accountable, so we have to find some way, a way to create this accountability, for, in particular for non-governmental organizations and publics. We have to look for effectiveness. It's, it's not worth working to a very complex agreement if it doesn't deliver, so it has to really be useful and limited to what is useful and not uh, just for the sake of having an agreement. It has, of course, a huge element of reduced uncertainty, which is basically the reason why many act actors are doubting on their capacity to deliver climate action. Sustainability, which is, I think, something that is coming on, and, uh, and it's good that you, don't, you cannot think uh, the transformation of societies through climate lens. You have to think more broadly to what sustainability is about, which is the way of development. And in a way, an epistemic quality, meaning that you cannot just ignore science. And that's a very important element, because many times in this process, we have had, of course, a strong contribution of IPCC. That will be the case in every step. And every step forward from this process is linked to, in, way, in a way or another, to IPCC report. But then we have to look for, in particular, uh, important on this long-term goal, which I will come back immediately in, in a minute, uh, what is consistent with scientific knowledge. We just cannot ignore this. And many times, of course, in the process, we have the scientific knowledge on the side and just proceed without referring to it. So that, in a way, is the elements we are looking for in each of the component of the climate regime we are trying to push forward. <clears throat> um, I just want to characterize what we think should be, and somebody, I think, uh, the journalist, uh, asked me uh, earlier on, what is really important for you in the Paris Agreement? And I could describe that these is these four elements, uh, or for five elements. In the legally binding agreement, we are looking for rules or commitments, uh, but we are really, uh, it is a process to build rules that are here to stay. So the, the idea that this agreement is not uh, for 10 years, but he has to define the rules for on a longer term, and uh, that rules are to be, uh, the binding element are, are to be the rules. The commitments themselves, it's that the numbers that countries are putting forward uh, should not probably be the, the embedded in the agreement, but yes, the rules and the commitment to implement. So I think that is a very important element of the uh, bindingness, in a way. This agreement has to refer to a long-term goal and uh, to move from a timetable and targets we had in the Kyoto thinking to something that it is more a decarbonization pathways. And you saw that progressively we try to adapt this language uh, in the discussion. <clears throat> Since Cancun, by the way, we try to adapt this language of the low-carbon economic pathways, uh, now we are just trying to, to look at it in a different way, to try to characterize what it is about decarbonization, in particular the energy system. And uh, we, we got in the G7 some kind of recognition that we, we have this long-term goal is not about an abstract figure of temperature, it's about doing something effectively about <coughs> uh, uh, energy in particular. So the long-term goal and the pathways notion, more than the timetable and targets, uh, is, uh, of course, a very important element. Then, um, in this agreement, we have to have some kind of revision mechanisms, uh, because that we know that, that the contribution is the initial contribution would not make it, and we have to upgrade, up update this contribution over time. We have to have somehow the relation between science and the delivery of the contributions, and to have a review of adequacy, at least an adequacy of commitment for the next phase, if we cannot, for a political reason, uh, produce a review on adequacy of achieved performance. Uh, and then we have to have, as well, um, 
uh, 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 transparency systems that create confidence that uh, no, nobody's cheating or not cheating too much, you might say so. So that, that are really the, I don't see the minimum because I don't, I don't know what will be the minimum, hopefully, but I think that's the central, the core, that makes sense for the agreement in Paris. And I'm certainly forgetting very important element. I haven't just point on mitigation, adaptation, on finance or technology, which are in a way the concrete expression, but this should be the core of the system to last. <clears throat> of course, on the contribution side, uh, we would like to have them uh, as many as possible. And uh, I, I, I didn't copy the good uh, formula that I didn't got the right example of my PVP, but I, I could come back to that later. So the, the idea on the contribution is really to shift from a logic of targets to a logic of pathways. And in this aspect, um, we try to accommodate the notion that uh, under a logic of pathways, countries have to think to their long-term pathways. And, uh, and they have to be, of course, combined with multi-time frame target packages as well with operational multi-sector. But uh, this idea that you have to think about the long term and not only on the first period, which is what, what is now on the table for 2025 or 2030, that is the way I think uh, we should, in a way, change the narrative. And it, it's coming, I think, to come. I, I now see countries like US or China happy to go with this uh, uh, pathway discussion. And uh, 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 surprisingly enough, uh, the, the Chinese leaders of the negotiation can say this agreement is there to support and develop uh, the, the low carbon pathway for all the economies at world level. So this notion of pathways of transition is now coming in in the process. I wanted just to revise with you uh, uh, where we are in geopolitical terms. And this is borrowed from a, a presentation from uh, EU Commission on the way they stated the state of the play, if I may say so, uh, of the different countries and the different group of negotiation. Uh, <clears throat> the first element on the legal form and the firewall means the firewall for those who are not, fortunately for them, uh, in this discussion since many, many years, meaning there is a difference, uh, a structural difference between the commitments of developed countries and developing countries. That's why we, that's, that we call the firewall. <clears throat> and uh, and in, of course, it's normally uh, take its major expression in the legal form. And so <clears throat> you see that on the legal form, the one who want the lesser legally binding elements in the agreement, you see that US and China uh, and some are on this side, uh, and, and MDCs, I think, yes? Yes, and Arab, country, Arab countries in particular would like really to have a very soft agreement with mainly voluntary commitments and no more than that. Whereas uh, EU, uh, less developed countries, AUSIS, ILAC, that is Latin, some, a group of Latin American countries, ALBA, which is another group of Latin American countries, want a strong legally binding rules. On this differentiation between developing countries and developed countries, of course, the weak, the weak differentiation, uh, <clears throat> with not so much surprise, comes on the US and EU side. And uh, ILAC and China are really in, 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 in the middle, in between, whereas LMDCs, which regroup a number of uh, developing countries, uh, middle-income developing countries mostly, there are some less developing countries in the group, uh, but more sort of, uh, they, they, that is their key point, that difference between developing and develop, and they want to keep the, the firewall intact. Uh, <clears throat> but Africa, houses, and uh, less developing countries are still uh, very keen to this differentiation. Uh, on uh, the mitigation uh, element, you see that, of course, a strong participation to reduce emission comes from the developed country side, mainly uh, EU, uh, US, uh, I see, uh, Singapore uh, are, are on this, uh, on this uh, element. China and LMDCs, of course, would like to take the less possible, even if China is sometimes in the middle, and uh, how this and uh, 
uh, less developed countries are the middle. Meaning not because uh, anybody asked to less developed countries to take any, any strong commitments, but because they insist probably sometimes more on adaptation than on mitigation for, in a way, something some, somehow surprising as a result. On the uh, ambition cycle, uh, China is certainly the more hostile to have a revision and, uh, of mechanism, whereas the uh, other ones are much more in favor of having a very strong, regular, every five years, uh, ratcheting up mechanism. And on transparency and rules, finally, um, of course, uh, you see that there is a big group in the middle and, and quite different of LMDCs, US LDCs, and AOZ small island, whereas the, the, the ones who are for stronger rules, South Africa, Brazil, EU, and AOZ are, are really on that side, whereas China and, uh, and uh, others are, are really wanting to have uh, the lesser, the more, the weaker rules in terms of transparency because of the issues about sovereignty. <clears throat> and on adaptation, you see that finally there is a majority of countries now that are in favor of having a strong dimension of adaptation in the agreement. Uh, Africa, AUSIS, LMDCs, China are all in favor. Uh, whether uh, US and uh, EU are more careful, because they would like, nevertheless, to have the agreement focusing uh, on uh, mitigation first. Where loss and damage, which is this... Uh, not liability, but the problem of solidarity with the victims of impact of climate change. Uh, US and EU are more, uh, doesn't want to have this strong in the agreement. Uh, they would like to have as a separate point uh, for the core, whereas LDCs and now this, of course, is a strong point. So that are the main elements. And on climate finance, uh, and the, uh, the group of developing countries is in majority is insisting on public finance, on the level of finance, whereas US and EU being in the middle, uh, whereas market finance through, fi finance through markets, uh, EU and China being the more advanced. I think US doesn't have a strong position on that for evident reasons because they are not prepared to buy anything outside, whereas EU is prepared and China wants markets to be there. Um, our this and MDCs and LDCs are not very, very, well, they are in the middle, they are not particularly against, not particularly for, whereas a, a group of countries, ALBA, is definitely against having market, anything about markets in the agreement. So we add to all this a pillar we call the Solution Action Agenda, which require, of course, uh, a little bit of thinking because it's a type of one uh, together with some other institution uh, of the climate regime that uh, doesn't, will not be part of the agreement per se. They will not be part of the MRV cycle. Uh, they will not make commitments officially within the agreement. But still we would like to, to have these non-state, non-party actors accountable, effective, and developing in a way a, a big support for the agreement itself, its long-term goal, and, and the shift uh, this agreement is representing. So uh, we first try to establish for, to convince parties that there was, there was a value of having an action agenda as a common outcome. One, because it facilitates the implementation of the existing INDC. Why, why this? It's quite evident that many countries were uh, concerned about uh, the, that this action agenda was a way for developed countries in particular to escape their obligation. So there is, of course, a lot of tension there. Uh, if we count or if we consider action from uh, local authorities, from financial institutions, from businesses, this is not the way to escape from formal obligation of governments. So that's why we insisted on showing that this is a way to facilitate the implementation, potentially to increase over time the ambition of future INDCs because it will lower the cost of technologies just because, take the very simple example of the green procurement policies of many cities at world level now that are putting in place, this create markets, this of course increase 
the technology supply and demand and supply and, and of course lowers the cost of technology. That will lower the cost of capital uh, and will of course generate higher political pressure, meaning it's more facilitated from the government action at domestic level. <clears throat> the, the second element was to send a strong signal that the transition to a low carbon economy is feasible, profitable, inevitable in a way that the self-fulfilling prophecy argument is in the other way. And in a nutshell, shaping expectation of all these actors. And that will, of course, contribute in a, in a very high way to this, to this element. What, uh, who are the actors we are trying to mobilize and to try to make a template of all to record and to register all this, all this action? The subnational authorities, which have been very, very active, the more active certainly uh, since uh, well before, before Copenhagen. The businesses, which are now coming in much more forcefully, uh, but not, for example, avoiding totally greenwashing, far from it. Uh, investors, uh, and in particular, that's the, really the new one, the, the banks, the institutional investors, the credit rating agencies, uh, the insurance companies uh, are coming now. And, and now, uh, I would say, the multilateral development banks, uh, largely because we ask them to come forward. And, uh, and they are coming forward, in particular by October, they will come with their plan to increase climate finance. There was a launch in uh, September, as you know, in New York, based on uh, a long-term action of many actors uh, on uh, some companies and some local authorities to develop uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives, uh, international public-private partnership, uh, an NGO, uh, uh, which really has uh, been quite active in pushing or supporting some uh, of this, in particular to try to uh, make accountable this engagement of non-state actors and to review. And you see now these days, they, for the moment, they, they lack a lot of quality, of uh, scientific quality, but a number of uh, reports you see to try to evaluate what is the real contribution of these actors. So uh, the NGOs are already playing a, a third-party role that I think is a good thing for the future with, of course, the condition that uh, there is really rigor in the analysis and the evaluation. <clears throat> so there is a political rationale to encourage na nation state to do more. Uh, that's what the sort of modifying the political economy that, of course, behind this is, is a main rationale to do that. And, um, and the, substantial, the substantive rationale is to catalyze concrete action on the ground which I think will give uh, many, there is a learning process out there, and, uh, and of course this has to be uh, developed. So, and uh, I can take example, I don't have so much time, but uh, we then develop a, a template for business um, to uh, really uh, um, to explain that, uh, and, and that of course are the key messages we wanted to have out of this action agenda that it is not a sideshow, which still was the case probably in New York. Uh, we want to create a virtual circle of increased ambition. Uh, we see that the financial, which are the philanthropies, have a strong role to play to support leaders of different initiatives. And um, the road to Paris um, is not so much imp so important, but the road from Paris, of course, is even more important, and we need to be well prepared. Now, of course, the question will be how we inscribe uh, this commitment in the, when, when I go back to the climate regime uh, figure I had in the beginning, and I will end there, how we inscribe this in the uh, agreement? Do we make a formal relation between all these elements and the agreement? And it is very important. How we, for example, capture what the MD, MDBs, thank you, what the MDBs would do? Uh, can we have a registry where the local authority or the region of the businesses will put their uh, uh, commitments? Should we have a, a body that revise these commitments? Um, can we ask them to sign up the agreement to the, object, the general objective of these agreements? Can we have, a, I take the example, for example, the um, um, aviation issue. We, we still, we try to regulate it, you know, 
to try to put a carbon price on their emission. We failed on the EU level, but they take then a voluntary commitment of halving by 50% their emission by 2050. Uh, meaning what? Uh, where do we put these uh, commitments? Who is controlling it? And do we ask the aviation company to sign up to the agreement? Should we ask the companies to display a long-term pathway of emission reduction to have their low carbon economy pathways? Should we create club of countries that can, for example, try to discuss between them of a carbon price or uh, to uh, develop technologies together or to develop uh, deep decarbonization pathways. That's something that, on the, based on the minimum, which will be the agreement, will try to produce or to foster this club of frontrunners, just to try to see that over time we can do much more than we believe nowadays. And technology, of course, is a key element of this, but not only that, uh, just uh, projecting, every type of actor has to project itself in its own capacity to what is a future and what a low carbon future represent for him in terms of the change in the activity, in the business model, in the way to behave, et cetera, et cetera. That's the type of thinking. Of course, I, I know we cannot develop all this by Paris, but we could at least create the framework where this behavior thinking scenario backcasting activities could take place in the future. And use, and that will be my final word, and sorry to have been so long, that these, 15 minutes, these five years between 2015 and 2020, between the entry into force of the agreement, would be, should be uh, taken as a fantastic opportunity to accelerate action and to put all this in place. So ideally, we will have this big picture in Paris. Ideally, we'll have the main rules. Ideally, we'll have this framework to have this new actors and this global vision to be inscribed in Paris and of course develop all the concrete elements afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>